And so we are sort of, I don't know, propagandized into thinking that all the good things in the world come from some guy being in charge and telling everybody else what to do. People look to the, the example of the military and they say, look at the military. The military gets stuff done. We've got a guy in charge and people who obey. So this should be the model for all of society. This is the, the sense people have. That's why I think some people accepted the idea that central economic planning was a good idea. Because it seemed to them, wouldn't it be better and more efficient for there to be some guy barking out orders to everybody instead of everybody just doing whatever he wants? That sounds chaotic and disorderly. We can't have that. Hey guys, it's Nas here. With everything going on in the world, especially in the U.S. and the presidential elections coming up, have you, have you ever thought about libertarianism? Uh, are you familiar with it? Are you, you know, did you consider it? Um, I wanted to share this uh, amazing speech by Tom Woods. He gave this uh, 11 years ago. And I feel like this was a very powerful speech, uh, especially when I started on my libertarian journey. And uh, to me, this just really made sense. So let's uh, watch this together and I will share my thoughts uh, as he's expressing these ideas. A lot to say to these people, so I'm going to zip through it. So I would start, first of all, I find it, there's a certain irony in what happens at your high school graduation when you always get that speech about you've got to follow your dreams. You can accomplish anything. But yet, the whole 12 years you've been in that school, they've been teaching you the exact opposite. You can't do anything. Only the government makes possible civilized life, and only the government makes it possible for you to survive and earn a living, and only the government makes it possible for you to work in decent conditions, and only the government makes the arts possible, only the government makes the sciences possible. Government, 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 government. But hey, you can do anything you want. What does that mean? Like, well, how do they have the nerve to give that speech? But anyway, they do. And so we are sort of, I don't know, propagandized into thinking that all the good things in the world come from some guy being in charge and telling everybody else what to do. People look to the, the example of the military and they say, look at the military. The military gets stuff done. We've got a guy in charge and people who obey. So this should be the model for all of society. This is the, the sense people have. That's why I think some people accepted the idea that central economic planning was a good idea. Because it seemed to them, wouldn't it be better and more efficient for there to be some guy barking out orders to everybody instead of everybody just doing whatever he wants? That sounds chaotic and disorderly. We can't, disorderly. We can't have that. So, first I would tell people, there are miracles that go on every single day in this world that occur simply because individuals are acting. Like, think for example, there was nobody in charge of the English language. There was no one guy who said, okay, everybody, I've decided, I've decided. The word for this is tree. Everybody got that? It's gonna be tree from now on. Like, <laughs> that didn't happen. And so it's not even like, as my friend Bob Murphy puts it, it's not that dictionary companies invented English. It's not like dictionary companies just forced upon us the meanings of the words, the dictionary companies are merely codifying our already customary practice of designating this as a tree. So where does English come from? It comes from just spontaneous interaction of people. There is no czar or commissar or planner of the English language, and yet there it is. But you could imagine, you could just imagine people today thinking that there must have been some English language commissar who developed the language. Or, or how about take a scientific field like physics? Now physics has progressed tremendously over the centuries and yet there is no guy. There's no guy with a giant physics hat and he's wearing a lab coat. He's in charge of physics. There's nobody in charge of physics. They have physics journals and the journals weed out, are supposed to weed out the bad articles, publish the good ones, and people build upon each other's work. And the result is this tremendous edifice of physics. And yet it develops with no guy doing it. No one even stops to marvel at this. But this contradicts this idea that you need some guy in charge. No, what's miraculous is how, how much we get done with nobody in charge. With just human beings interacting with each other, like uh, with other human beings. Just, that's it. 
Yeah, to me, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I feel like at the end of the day, we all work towards our you know, self-interest. So if we were to truly do that and like if everyone was working towards their self-interest, they would actually work together. And, you know, he's going to point out some uh, other things that, you know, that showcase that. But uh, just, you know, in my personal experience, like anytime um, I've been, you know, like uh, if it was something at work where it's like a team environment, uh, yeah, there's, you know, someone uh, kind of, giving a structure like there is someone who's you know planning things out but if you're working in a team uh then everyone is incentivized to succeed right and so when everyone is incentivized to succeed you tend to work together because it's in your best interest like if you do work together you're gonna be uh you're gonna be on the track to succeed whereas if you're if you just see everyone as uh as a foe or competition, then it's going to be a lot, a uh, lot more difficult. And so I, I think what he says, you know, makes sense. Um, you know, you you don't like humans. I feel like we're just good. We're problem solvers by nature. And I feel like, you know, anytime there is a problem in the market, uh, we have come up with solutions for them. It's not, you know, government that comes up with that solution, but is people getting together and in being innovative. Uh, as, as soon as the government steps in and sort of takes over, I feel like the, innova uh, the innovation kind of slows down or stops or, uh, you know, just, you know, becomes worse. Uh, but anytime people are left to their own I would say their own self-interest, they're gonna try to improve it. So like if you take a business and you know in in a completely free market environment, if a business uh, opens up and is providing this new service and then another business opens up and provides you know the same service, both businesses are gonna try to compete. Uh, you know, there may be one business that may, you know, cut corners or uh, basically try to, you know, uh, take the easy way out. But what that will do is just have, you know, like if you're in it for a quick buck, then you're not thinking long term and you're going to fail. So uh, the market incentivizes for you to think long term and plan ahead and, you know, be fair and provide the best good or service. And I think that's the whole point. Like you don't, you don't need an outside entity such as the government to dictate what's safe, what's good and what's not. Uh, you know, every, every situation you can think of in history, especially during the industrial revolution, like when something new comes up, comes up or comes out, you know, it's not safe right away because these are something brand new, but everyone has an interest in it for it to be safe because the people who's creating the thing they want to make money and you know and the people that the the product is helping you know they want to continue to use that product or service or good or what have you so it's in there it, it's in everyone's interest for that to succeed and in order for that to happen they uh you know the business owner or the inventor or they're just going to try like you know, the market forces are going to force them to basically improve on that. Uh, like the one thing I could think of is, uh, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, you know, the working conditions weren't so safe and, you know, good and people were getting injured, dying. But, uh, you know, as technology got uh, a little bit better and they were investing in the, you know, the to make the workplace safer because again if it wasn't a safe environment then the person who owns the plantation or the factory you know they're losing out on money right so because if it's not safe then people are not going to work people are going to leave uh they're not going to be able to sell their product so they're going to be uh, they're going to be losing so it's in their best interest to you know come up with a safer method but everything you know when it's new there's, you know, it's a risk, right? It's, um, there's uncertainty. 
So, so yeah, um, during that time, you know, uh, things were already getting safer and then the government created OSHA, but then OSHA claimed that, you know, OSHA made, uh, you know, they made those safer, which, you know, isn't the case. It's things were becoming safer and then OSHA came in and, you know, basically claimed that. So that's pretty much what Tom Woods is saying, but he's also going to give some other really great examples. So let's uh, take a listen. Where we interact with each other without some guy with a bullhorn. And it's astonishing what we can accomplish. Like, for example, I'm sure everybody in this room is at least familiar with that Leonard Reed essay that Milton Friedman popularized, I Pencil. So Milton Friedman holds up this pencil and he says, look, I got a freaking pencil over here. You look at the things in this pencil and you realize there's no person on earth who could, who could produce this pencil. And you're skeptical of that. You think, oh, I know, I know Joe works at the pencil factory. He could make a pencil. But when you think about it, it's actually quite difficult. The pencil begins with a tree. You've got to chop down the tree. What are you going to chop down the tree with? Well, you're going to need uh, an axe or you're going to need a saw. What's the saw going to be made out of? It's going to be made out of steel. And for steel, you need iron ore. And then you need transportation to transport the steel from one place to another. The transportation requires gasoline, which requires uh, oil refinery. All these different things that you would need to be an expert in to create a pencil, no human brain could possibly contain. Mm -hmm. So there are all, the, and that's not to mention the rubber for the eraser, the graphite, which comes from South America, all these different things coming together to produce an object that costs you a few cents. Now, could you imagine before we had pencils describing to people, all right, here's what we need to do. All right, first we've got to go to this continent, then that continent, then we've got to get the graphite, we've got to chop down the tree, we've got to produce paint, requires all these ingredients and all these processes. Then we've got to shave down the, the wood to make it all nice and smooth. Where people would say, my gosh, this, this device is going to cost like a billion dollars. And we're going to need some pencil commissar in charge of this thing. We would never have produced a pencil. No one would even try. And yet this happens every single day and nobody even notices it. Nobody even notices the miracle of this without any central direction, without that bullhorn guy. These miracles go on every day and we are not ever taught to stop and appreciate them for a change. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was one time I had a sick child. She needed a vaporizer in the middle of the night. So in the middle of the night I go to the store, I buy her a vaporizer for $10. And I actually, this is not a joke, I stood there in the store and I marveled at the fact that I just bought a vaporizer for my sick kid in the middle of the night for $10. And this is incredible. Think of all the things that had to come together to make this possible. And then I realized, wait a minute, I have a sick kid. I can't really be standing around here philosophizing. I gotta get, I gotta get out of here. But you know what we are taught to do, though, in school? We're not taught to appreciate markets or the price system that makes all this miraculous stuff possible. No, we're taught how a bill becomes a law. Yeah. So right away, it prejudices people in favor of government activity. I know all about how a bill becomes a law, but I have absolutely no idea how a pencil could be possible. And I have so no idea about it that I don't even have the idea to ask myself the question. So these miracles take place every day. And in fact, on the free market, we have what the great Frederick Bastiat called economic harmonies. That on the market, we are all acting harmoniously in cooperation and concert together. That workers and businessmen have the same interests, not contrary interests, the same interests. The businessman wants low taxes on his business so that he can make more profits. But the worker also wants low taxes on that business because the more profits that are earned, the more the businessman can invest those profits in capital equipment, that makes the worker more physically productive. That means more goods are produced, and more, when more goods are produced, vis-a-vis -vis the amount of money in the economy, that makes your money worth more. The money stays roughly the same, the goods are increased. We all become wealthier through this process. The only thing government can contribute to that healthy process is stagnation and retrogression. That's it. All they can do is tax this wonderful process by which all of us working together improve our living conditions. Yeah, also when government steps in and, you know, obviously have taxes and creates regulations, they end up just making that business bigger because 
what happens is, you know, these businesses, uh, if they're already wealthy or, you know, most of the time it, that's the case, uh, they just end up having lobbyists or they just buy people in, in, uh, in government to, you know, create regulations that favor them and stifle the new business from being created. Um, so, you know, like that's usually the case. Uh, I don't know if you watched, uh, you, you know, my previous video on um, a minimum wage, but that's exactly what, what they do. So when a business becomes at a, you know, a pretty large, right? And the government thinks, oh, okay, we, we have to stop this monopoly. You know, they eventually just make that business a monopoly. Whereas if they pretty much just left it alone, then the markets will will find a way to compete. Like if the business is being successful in doing something, the market and the market represents the people, right? Like the people are gonna because if that business is the only business that's producing that good or service, uh, then they're probably you know charging a lot and it's very very expensive. So the solution the market will come up with is. Uh, you know, another uh, alternative business. So if you remember, uh, like the, the example that comes to my mind is uh, Uber, uh, you know, Lyft, and then for a period of time, you had uh, Juno, right? Now, uh, at least in New York, I don't know about other places, but, you know, that was the, those were the, the three, you know, competitive uh, businesses in, um, you know, ride sharing. And, you uh, you know, when a, a business can't compete, they go out of business. So same thing like uh, Uber, Lyft, even though those are heavily government uh, regulated, when, you know, Juno came in, they just couldn't, they couldn't compete because their services weren't as good and they couldn't provide the same thing. So if government just left, uh, let's say government didn't regulate uh, Uber or, or uh, Lyft, there would have been multiple businesses in that space because they're all trying to capitalize on on the market need, right? And every, they will all try to, uh, you know, make money from that. And I know a lot of people will say like, oh, but the new new businesses that come up in that space, like what if they're not safe? What if, uh, you know, they're reckless drivers or whatever? The thing is, they have an interest to not do that because at the end of the day, they, you know, like if they want to make long-term money and continue doing this as uh, some type of a job or a career, then it's in their best interest to, you know, be a safe driver. Uh, not only that, you know, all those businesses had a rating system, which I think, you know, that can just apply to, to the market and not something the government needs to control. So like, the people can say uh, if, you know, if a business is worth the money or worth the time, you know, like we have Yelp for restaurants, you know, like those kind of systems can always exist in a completely free market. And it's a, it's a much better system and a much better way for businesses to run and compete, but stay innovative and actually compete for our dollar, right? Whereas if the government controls like all the regulations and policies, then those businesses, you know, get, get to a point where they're big, they're rich, and they can just, you know, buy, buy the lobbyists, I mean, buy the politicians through lobbying and that sort of thing and create, uh, you know, create regulations that help them but hurt other businesses from starting. And, that's how they eliminate competition. So, so yeah, I, I feel like government actually just, you know, uh, creates the monopolies and, you know, takes away competition. So I think a free market, especially, uh, you know, the libertarian philosophies, I feel like would ap absolutely work. Um, so yeah, let's continue watching this. But what does the state create? Does it create economic harmonies? No, the state can only create conflict. It gives a special privilege to one group that harms the other groups. That encourages the other groups to lobby for their own special privileges, which in turn harm everyone else. 
and it encourages a kind of low-intensity civil war of all against all. There's no economic harmonies there. Now, but, but they say that what I'm saying to you is too simplistic. They say that freedom yields you bad things. It yields you poverty, poor working conditions, and all the rest of it. All the things we learned in the seventh grade. The free market gives you all those things. But as I just explained, it's the market that curbs those things. Imagine in the 18th century, imagine the year 1700. Why are people poor in 1700? Is it because the rich people are wickedly depriving the poor of all the flat screen TVs in the year 1700? Why is it? Why is it that in the year 1700, nobody protests against the existence of poverty? It's because in the year 1700, it never occurred to anyone that you could abolish poverty. It, it, it was assumed that the world you're going to be born into is a filthy world of squalor. You're going to live your life one bad harvest away from starvation, and then you're going to drop dead. No one had figured you could get away with a life better than that. It's only when you get the market economy, it's so fantastic as a wealth creator that you realize, wait a minute, people don't have to live like savages anymore. It is possible to lift people out of this thing. Well, the reason people are poor in 1700 is they're doing most of their work by hand. Imagine if today we get rid of all the equipment we use to produce things, we produce everything by hand. We would produce like what, one three hundredth of what we produce now, if even that? And there would be whole classes of goods we couldn't produce at all. It kind of just made me think of, you know, so something I said earlier where, you know, businesses, new businesses come up and they compete. Uh, I, I know this is a little bit different from what he is saying, but uh, one idea or one thought that came to my mind is that the way businesses compete, and uh, I, I guess I didn't really explain uh, the innovation part, is that if a business is successful, uh, another business is going to try to figure out how they can do it better so that they get those customers. Because obviously, if a business has uh, has big, cornered a market for a certain uh, good or service, if somebody else is coming along, they want to compete and they want to make money. They want to, uh, you know, potentially make more money. So, and how will they do that? They have to, you know, do something better. So that is like the constant competition, but that also affects uh, the the wages, right? So like if a new, if a business is, you know, has a market cornered and provides a good and service and they're paying, let's say $5 an hour uh, for their, you know, for their wages and uh, a new business comes along and wants to compete in that market they're, they pretty much have the same good and services, but one thing they could do maybe is offer, uh, you know, 550 an hour, right? And that way, what they're doing is now they're competing for the workers, they're competing for the labor. So if the, the business that's on top, if they want to compete with that, now they have to raise their, their, uh, their wage so that they don't lose their, their workers. So uh, again, I think a free market definitely uh, helps everyone. It and it keeps the businesses honest because again, they're in business to make a profit, to make money. So if you let that play out, then they're the only way they can actually make money is to provide something that that you know people want and need. Uh, other than that, if you know, if they can't provide that, they're not going to make money. They're going to fail. And, you know, you can look at many different examples throughout history of businesses that, you know, uh, couldn't compete, couldn't adapt to the times, uh, you know, like Blockbuster or, you know, so many of the department stores, you know, after everything became uh, digital and, uh, you know, stores are online. So, you know, things like that, like if, if the business can't provide what the market needs, then it's naturally going to go out of business. However, on the other end, if you have governments uh, interfering, you know, co uh, creating regulations and things like that, it's also, you know, like in order for the government to keep getting paid, well, not the government, but maybe the lobbyists or certain politicians, if they want to keep getting paid, 
they are going to they're going to do everything in their power to keep that business going even if that business uh shouldn't be like even that even if that business should fail so for example i could uh what i can think of is corporate welfare during uh covid right uh many of the businesses where people weren't even going to like movie theaters uh you know uh, airlines and people weren't traveling people weren't doing any of that uh, naturally, those businesses would have had to restructure, figure something out, or go out of business. Like that would be the natural way it would work. Whereas at that point, uh, at that time, the government, you know, subsidized uh, and basically gave them corporate welfare uh, from the taxpayers to keep those businesses going and running. Uh, when naturally they would have just failed, and new businesses would have started and new uh new innovations would have happened so yeah so like if a government uh basically puts their puts their hand in uh in in that jar then all all you get is you know a worse off economy whereas if it's completely free and people are working together to figure out new you know new ideas then things improve and innovate but yeah let's continue Oh, tr try to engage in, in, in coal mining with just your bare hands. Good luck. Try to engage in, in any type of mining or raw material extraction of any kind. Forget it. None of that stuff could even be done. So of course they're going to be poor. It's not that the rich have taken all the stuff from them. If you redistributed everything the rich person had in 1700 and gave it to everybody else, everybody else would wind up with an extra two cents and then that would be it. That rich person would move out of the country before this could be done to him again. That'd be it. Congratulations. The only way you can improve things is by letting the market function, let profits be reinvested, and build that machinery so that we become more productive. Goods become more abundant and their prices come down relative to wages. That is the only way we can become better off. I've talked about working conditions in a couple of my books. I won't uh, dwell on that, but that is also something that the market makes possible. If we went over to Bangladesh today and said, you people have to work in terrible conditions, so today we're going to impose the U.S. Federal Register of Regulations upon the whole country, would that mean that the next day everyone would be working in a wonderful air-conditioned office building? No, it would mean the next day everybody's unemployed. No one could afford that in Bangladesh. So it can't possibly be uh, quite that simple, and it, it is indeed the market that makes possible the wealth. As a person from Bangladesh, uh, yeah, that's absolutely correct. You know, if U.S. were to just interject their standards, then yeah, the the business owners over there uh, wouldn't be able to, you know, just adopt it because again, they couldn't afford it, and you know, you're just gonna have more people out of work rather than you know slowly uh, get slowly improving and uh, upgrading. So yeah, absolutely correct that allows us to work in, in better conditions. In fact, I have got, I just returned from Spain, so I hardly even know what time it is or what day it is or what country I'm in, but I was in Spain earlier this week, I gave a talk there. People were telling me that in Spain, it is so difficult to start a business. There is so much bureaucracy and so much red tape that only the very wealthy can afford to do it which is why you see gigantic businesses there. You don't see, even in this country with our curtailed freedoms, we still have some small entrepreneurs popping up. You just don't see that in Spain. You're either poor or you're super duper rich because only the super duper rich can possibly navigate the regulatory thicket that the state has imposed. The state, by the way, which portrays itself as the great savior of the poor. Well, how about poverty around the world? Is that the fault of the free market? Is that the fault of you and me, of us being free? Well, in fact, this is the century, the 21st century and the 20th century combined. These are the centuries where we've started to see, after some, some years of, 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 of third way central planning, we start to see in the mid 20th century, but starting really in the, in the 80s, a lot of liberalization of the good sort around the world. And what did we see? Poverty fell dramatically. Absolute poverty amounted to 85% of the world population in 1820. By 1950, that was down to 50%. By the early 1980s, down to 33%. And by 2001, down to 18%. The world has never seen that amount of, of poverty alleviation ever, ever. 
at the very time that markets are opening up. Never seen any progress like this. Do we read that in the newspaper? Hey, great news, everybody. The New York Times, hey, great news. Look, poverty is real. No, nothing, nothing. We are led to believe that the poor are poor because the rich took all their stuff. When did these poor people have all that stuff, for one thing? I mean, this is, or, or the poor get poorer, the rich get richer. It's, this can't possibly be The poor, at some point you hit subsistence level. If you get any poor, I mean, I, the, the, the phrase doesn't even make sense. But exactly the opposite is the truth. Now, governments did try to help people. We had foreign aid programs in the 20th century. And everybody, all the experts said the foreign aid programs are indispensable to lifting these people out of poverty. What did these foreign aid programs do? They kept these people in poverty. In case after case after case. There is almost nothing in the history of mankind that has a worse record than Western, than Western government. Yeah, also that I think applies to the U.S. and, and welfare. Uh, I think, you know, I, like, I think it's with good intention, intentions, but uh, ultimately it's, you know, it doesn't help. It just hooks people. It's almost like a drug and it just, you know, keeps people dependent on it. Whereas I, I think it's human nature to do things, uh, you know, spend as little energy on something or do things as easily as possible. So if you're, you know, incentivizing, uh, let's say like not working, you're incentivized, you're saying that like, oh, we'll pay, you know, we'll give you this much money. Um, and so you're, you realize you can get that without working or without putting that much effort, then why would you, right? So it definitely, you know, incentivizes people in a negative way. Whereas if, uh, you know, if it was restructured or taken away, then it's like you have to figure something out. You have to be innovative or you're just, you know, you're not going to survive. And that is that is a strong, that's a much stronger motivator to do well than to just get something, you know, get a handout. And I, I think, you know, that's that's the main point, like giving all these countries uh, these different things. It's like, okay, well, if we're getting it, then why innovate? Like why, you know, we're just, we're just going to continue with, with this amount uh, that we're getting. So yeah, they, it doesn't, it basically makes people less competitive and less innovative. So yeah. Governments and their state led development schemes. Absolutely appalling. It led to retrogression, not progress. This was the attempt of governments to help. When they stopped helping, things got a lot better. When uh, it also made me think of the Milton Friedman, uh, Milton Friedman quote, I, you know, every, no, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Chile had foreign aid cut off, when South Korea had foreign aid cut off, or Hong Kong, these places flourished because no longer could their crummy status policies be subsidized. They have to adopt the free market. The result was fantastic prosperity. Well, All right, we can stop it there. Uh, if you guys want to check this out, I will leave a link in the description so you can watch the whole thing. But yeah, this was a really good speech. Uh, you can check out his other work, uh, other works. Uh, yeah, Tom Woods is excellent on a lot of these ideas. Actually, almost all of these ideas. Uh, the, I don't find anything I disagree in terms of libertarian values and things like that. So yeah, definitely check Tom Woods out. Um, what did you guys think? And I, I do this without any script and I just kind of, whatever comes to my head, I you know express. So if I am incoherent or all over the place, you know, excuse me, just let me know. And uh, you know, I, if, that, if, it, if it's hard for you to follow, then maybe I will start, you know, creating a script, but I find this a little bit more fun and it allows me to kind of think on the spot. So, but yeah, let me know what you think about it. Um, yeah, and let me know what you uh, overall thought about, thought about this. Uh, are you familiar with libertarianism? Is this something, you know, you, you're thinking about, especially that with uh, the elections coming up? Uh, you know, like, will this impact how you vote or how you think about your everyday life? You know, comment down below, let me know. And uh, yeah, don't forget to like, share, subscribe if you haven't, and I will catch you on the next one. Take care.